Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Jim DiBiase. I'm with 3D Communications. This is my colleague, colleague Bert Regeer. Uh, and uh, this, this course tonight is about how to fly airplanes. So I know you're all interested in aviation. And No? OK. So <laughs> well, how about it's, it's about how not to crash and burn. Uh, so we'll make sure there's no crashing that's going on. Now, we're, we're here tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about the FDA Advisory Committee process. Uh, Bert is going to talk about the different types of FDA meetings. Uh, Bert came all the way from California, where Ariana's from, because he heard Ariana was going to be here from California tonight. So he, he flew in uh, uh, primarily because he wanted to drink my wine. Uh, so I'm, I'm, a, a local trans, I, I'm a local Raleigh transplant coming from, uh, I'm a Yankee who moved down here three years ago. How many Yankees do we have in the room? Do they have some Yankees? Oh. Wow, that's what I'm finding. It's like half of my neighbors are not North Carolinians. And, and my wife was born in North Carolina and lived here for about nine months before she moved. So she tells all her friends that she's actually a native North Carolinian, which I guess is true. So uh, we, we love the South, uh, and I love doing events like this. And I, I plan to, this is Carrie Newton. Carrie is a, uh, another 3D colleague, uh, as is Lee Mullen. Lee is another 3D colleague. So Lee's here. Lee's a medical writer who works for 3D. Carrie does all our sales and marketing. Bert is an MD, oncologist, and I'm just the guy who started the company 15 years ago. I actually don't have a scientific background at all. I call myself a communicologist, so I'm going to talk to you about how to communicate the information uh, from, from these clinical trials. And uh, I've, for the last 15 years, I've pretty much done nothing but FDA advisory committee preparation. So we've helped over 190 companies prepare for 250 advisory committee meetings. So in this one little category, I could actually make a, make a presentation to a bunch of people who are a lot smarter than I am. Uh, so, but I think I'll be able to answer all of your questions about advisory committee prep. Uh, has anybody here ever been through an FDA advisory committee meeting? Show of hands. One, two. W was it a good experience? Yes. No. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, what is it? Kanya. Kanya Lane Pringle. And I, I, I assume you didn't work with 3D communications on that advisory committee because it would have been a great experience if you had. And John, right? John? Yeah. And uh, so you've been through one too. Was yours a good experience? It was pretty good. It, was a, it, it went, believe it or not, mostly Good. They often do. They often do. Um, so uh, how many people from industry? Right? So almost, almost everybody. And if you're not from industry, academia? Yeah? OK. And anybody here from FDA? <laughs> Darn. No, I love having FDA people in the room because we get, we get into a real dialogue. And sometimes it happens and we get into a real dialogue of perspectives. Because a lot of what I'm going to say tonight, um, it, it might not sound like, uh, like, and I have total respect for the FDA, but it might not sound all the time like we do. Uh, because an advisory committee uh, is not necessarily a purely scientific meeting. Uh, there's a lot of theater to it. And part of the reason there's a lot of theater to it uh, is because of the way it's set up. And I'll show you an agenda in a second where the sponsor has about an hour to present all their data. And if you've been involved in a detailed clinical development program uh, where there's multiple studies, very complicated data, and then you're asked to present for an hour, and at the end of the day, they vote. So you've, you've worked on this project for a decade and you've spent hundreds of millions of dollars and you get one hour to present, you re there really needs to be a lot of impact in, in your messaging. So it's not a pure scientific discussion. Um, and that can sometimes sound like a negative thing, but it doesn't have to be. So what we're going to talk to, has everybody read Chapter 5? Uh, no? Well, at least you're honest. OK. Well, good. Well, so then this information will all be new. Fantastic. So <laughs> when you go back and read Chapter 5, um, you'll see that we've structured this set of slides uh, along exactly along the lines of the chapter. So pl please feel free to like, jump in, ask questions, interrupt. This shouldn't be 45 minutes of me just chatting, and then Bert's going to get up for about 45 minutes. So the, the topic, obviously, is preparing for an advisory committee. And these are the, the objectives in chapter 8. So we'll go through each one of these objectives one by one, because we want to, from what I hear, this exam is 
is uh, somewhat structured to follow fundamentals of U.S. regulatory affairs. And let's face it, I think we're all here because we want to pass the exam, right? So let's talk a little bit about just advisory committees to make sure we understand, for those of you who haven't been to it, which is most in the room, to completely understand what the day is like. So we'll go through, uh, so I'm going to refer to them as adcoms, uh, just for short. And we're going to go through a typical agenda. Uh, first of all, there's 50 different advisory committees or panels that the FDA has set up. So there'll be one for circulatory devices, there'll be one for neurologic drugs, there'll be one for oncology, 50 different advisory committee meetings. And the people who sit around the advisory committee, you, are not FDA. They're, they're experts that are brought in to, from either industry or academia um, or from hospitals. Uh, on almost a volunteer basis. They get paid very little, so it's really tr truly public service. And they're there to advise and give the FDA independent expert opinion. We're going to see in a second that the experts are not always experts on a specific product or drug. Um, there's about 10 to 20, depending on the, the committee. I've had as many as 38, where there's a joint committee. Some, I've had you know, a triple joint committee, if there's such a thing. Um, of it was drug safety, anesthesiology, um, and I think it was um, um, of non-prescription drugs for it was they looked at acetaminophen. So that was the biggest one. So you can get it can get crazy. You have 38 people around the U, and they all start asking questions. It could you know it could be at comes gone wild. Uh, there is there, so you have clinicians, researchers, statisticians. There's a chair. And most are voting members. There will be some non-voting members. Uh, the, there's a consumer rep and a patient rep. Depending on the committee, they may or may not vote. And then there's an industry rep, never votes. It doesn't matter what committee they're on. They're conflicted by nature. And they're there just to make sure that the advisory committee doesn't go down too many tangents that could have a damaging impact on industry. So they're really there to protect industry. As I mentioned earlier, it's public service. Does anybody know what advisory committee members get paid to sit on the committee? And it's not zero, but it's pretty darn close. What's that? Minimum wage. It's about, well, it's a little, it's a little bit better than that. Um, it's, it's $80 an hour. So if you think about, you know, that, that might sound like a lot, uh, but so you figure about $1,000 for the day, and that includes prep time and travel time. These are clinicians. They're taking a day out of their Act, uh, out of their clinical practice, so it's, it's really not a lot of money to them. They're not doing it for the money. Um, so they're really doing it for public service. And that's important because we have data. We've done a lot of survey data. We have a database of former advisory committee members that clearly show us from their own responses that they don't spend a lot of time preparing for the meeting. That the range is four to seven hours. They spend, and that's self-reported, so you know it's inflated. And we sorted our data by zip code. And the, the further away they were, the higher their prep time was, which means they're basically traveling and you know, they're prepping during their travel time. So they're going to come in not knowing a lot of information. You, you're going to prepare a briefing book, and, and they may or may not have read the briefing book. So that one hour presentation and the Q&A becomes incredibly important to delivering your message. The, the call to order happens at 8 a.m. and there are some FDA introductory remarks. And then you, the sponsor, will give a, a presentation. It's going to be about an hour, anywhere between 45 minutes and an hour and a half, depending on what you ask for. Then there's going to be about 15 minutes to 30 minutes of clarifying questions. So the, the 10 to 20 members around the panel will, will ask questions of the sponsor. And they could be on any topic within reason. Then there's a break. Then the FDA gets up and hopefully gives a completely redundant presentation. Hopefully they're not disagreeing or presenting new data. And that's really important as, as regulatory experts. You're going to have to be communicating very clearly with the FDA, and Bert's going to talk about that, to make sure there's an alignment. Because if you present the data one way and the FDA pre presents the data another way, who do you think the committee is going to believe? The FDA. And it's just going to confuse them. So you, know, you want to get that alignment going into the, into the meeting. Then there's going to be some question and answer for the FDA. 
Uh, and often the sponsor gets up to answer those questions because the FDA doesn't have the in-depth knowledge of the data in all cases that you may have. Often they do, but not in all cases. So sometimes the sponsor gets back up. Then there's a lunch break and something called the open public hearing. And the open public hearing is just that. Anybody in the United States can, actually anybody in the world, can register to speak at the open public hearing. The designated federal official will take applications via email or in writing, and they'll decide who gets to present during the open public hearing. If they get less than 12 to 15, they let everybody. It's at one hour. It, they get about five, five minutes to present. So if you know 20 people show up, everything's fine. If 30 people register, then the FDA will either cut their time down so everybody can present, or they'll do a lottery. It's a random lottery, just a random draw. And they'll tell people then who can come to the open public hearing. And that's a very important aspect of preparing for an advisory committee, because right after the open public hearing, you're going to get the committee deliberation, the questions to the committee. So in advance of the meeting, FDA has sent out a briefing book to, if, if, if it's on the drug side, it's, I'm, I'm going to try to cover drugs and devices. If it's on the drug side, FDA has sent out a briefing book about a month in advance to all of the advisory committee members. And it's their take on the data. If it's on the drug side, the sponsor also prepares their own briefing book. So the panel members get two briefing books to read. Remember, they're getting $80 an hour, so not a whole lot of time. Our data shows they always read the FDA's briefing book. They sometimes read the sponsor's briefing book. So it's, again, important to have alignment. If, it's, if you're on the device side, the, F, uh, the sponsor does an F, uh, a briefing book, and then the FDA puts just a summary on it. It's just a, a very short, normally a pretty short um, summary of the differences or issues that the FDA has with the sponsor's briefing book. So in a lot of ways, I think the device group does a little bit better job in preparing the advisory committee members. They really highlight the differences they have with the sponsor's data. That's the day. It's questions for the committee. Sometimes there's discussion questions. There's often three voting questions. There's normally one on safety, normally one on efficacy, and then or effectiveness on the device side, and normally one on the overall benefit risk or approvability. FDA. Uh, normally follows the advice of the advisory committee members. I have a handful of examples where they have not followed the advice, but I would say more than nine times out of ten, if the advisory committee votes that the product should be approved, they get approval. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. Any questions so far? Yes. Thank you. What's your name? Hi. Uh, nice to meet you. Yeah, hi. Uh, so the question is, you said there would be, if there are 30 questions and only 15 of them would be answered randomly by lottery? No, so that's for the open public hearing. Okay. If, if 30 people register, right. they only have an hour. Okay. So the designated federal official either has to cut everybody down to two minutes, which they rarely do, or they cut the amount of people who actually can present that day, and they do that through a random, they, they select the people for the open public hearing randomly. But the rest of the questions would be answered as well, not publicly, but they would still be addressed. So there's the open public hearing, which is just members from the public, and then there's the advisory committee who's members who sit around the U. They get to ask questions all afternoon. And the committee chairperson is the person who decides who gets to ask their questions first. But normally, the chairperson goes around the U and makes sure everybody, all of the advisory committee members, get to actually ask the questions. Okay, so two different sections of the meeting. We have over here these clarifying questions, these clarifying questions, and questions to the committee and discussion. The chairperson is directing those questions. For the open public hearing, this one hour, that is, there's, the advisors don't ask people from the public questions. They just get up, make a statement, and sit down. It's normally patients. Sometimes it's, um, it's advocacy groups who speak either for or against approval. Yes? Uh, it was mentioned in a previous presentation that sometimes a competitor may 
um, try to present during that open public hearing yep. portion, is that taking into account what they're saying or whether they'd be selected, just so, you know, not to make this a he said, she said right. situation? So it's interesting. It's, uh, again, we've done about 200 advisory committee meetings. I think I've seen that happen twice. So the odds are, are pretty rare. I think even by regulatory standards, one out of 100 is rare. Actually, no, one out of 100 is pretty common by regulatory standards. Uh, but it's pretty rare for advisory committees. And we advise our clients not to do Like when our, when our clients say to us, well, do you, there's, there's a competitor meeting before our meeting. Should we go and present some of our data and contrast that we always say, no, please don't. It just, it's not going to help you in the eyes of these academicians and clinicians who, who appropriately care more about the patient than any given product. And it's really hard, even if, if you think your message is important to patients, it's not going to come off that way. So wait for your day, present your data on your day, and let your competitors present their data on their day. So my experience, even in the, the two or so that I've seen, is that it, it's completely discounted and doesn't go over well at all. So. I, I had Last I had one uh, competitor who came in who supported the approval for the product. So that, that one came over very well. So. <laughs> there you go. Well, there's a theory to that, right? All, all boats rise with the tide. You know, if, if, it's a, if a similar product, similar indication, similar mechanism of action. But I would even think that would be, well, of course he's supporting the product because he's going to come in two weeks and present in front of the advisory committee for his drug approval. So, you know, just present your data. But very good question. So most of the advisory committee meetings, almost all of the drugs are at the great room at White Oak. The devices are still going to hotels. Uh, this is the way the room is set up. So in the U, there's the advisory committee members. And again, these are academic, academicians and clinicians who are not FDA employees who will do the voting that day. And then you're going to have your presenters and your responders. This is set up for a, a drug. The device setup is a little bit different. That, that's really important. So you're going to present, the presenter is going to be over here. And most companies bring additional presenters and additional responders. And I'll, I'll go over the, the typical presentation in a little bit. But you will often have subject matter experts. So for example, a biostatistician who may not present uh, the statistical data, but will be there in case there are detailed statistical questions. Or somebody, a PKPD expert. There's rarely a separate PKPD presentation. If you present some PK data, it's normally done in either efficacy or safety, depending on what your message is around the data, and it's done by that presenter. But there might be a PK expert as a responder. And this will be important as we talk about some of the roles in a little bit. And then there's people here called triage, what we call triage anyway. These are the people who find slides to answer questions during the Q&A. So they put the slide up for the responder, so they have something to answer the, answer the question, some data to answer the question with, and then the responder can put the slide up for everybody to see if he or she chooses to do so. Does that make sense so far? Okay. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there's an, there's an open public hearing where the audience members can come up if they registered and speak during that one hour period. Then we have something called the back room. If you've, if you've presented an advisory committee or watched an advisory committee, sometimes you'll hear the moderator say, let us get you that information after the break. We don't have a slide on that right now. We have the data. Let us summarize it. Put it on a slide and come back to you so we can answer the question succinctly. So we recommend that there's a back room. And at White Oak, they, they have two back rooms that they give to the sponsor. And you have a team back there listening to the meeting. And when the moderator says, let us try to get you that information after the break, these people go, ah, let's do it. Let's put it all together. Let's, you know, let's query the data, put together a slide, you know, come up with what the answer should be. So then when they come back, when the presenters and the moderator and responders come back to the back room during the break, there's something to look at. So there's a lot going on. You need a team here. So let's talk about selecting the team. You know, who, who are your different team members? Uh, you're going to have medical writers, because medical writers are very important, aren't they, Lee? So we're going to have medical writers, and the medical writer's primary role will be to write that briefing book that the advisory committee members get, again, about a month before the actual meeting. There's going to be presenters. 
they present the core, we call that core presentation. That's that 45 minutes to an hour to an hour and a half where it's didactic, uninterrupted. Sort of like how this is going, which is not supposed to be like that. You're supposed to be interrupting me and asking questions. But at the advisory committee member, in the last 10 years, they've stopped interrupting. I, when I first started the company they, uh, and we started prepping, they used to actually interrupt and ask questions in between each section. It was a nightmare because uh, it was eating into the, the sponsor's time. So FDA wisely stopped doing that. Then you're going to have the moderator. So after the presentation, the moderator is going to answer, take a first shot at answering the question. That moderator may call up other responders who may have presented earlier to try to answer questions too. But the moderator, sort of the master of ceremonies, he or she fields all the questions. So that's, that person really needs to know the data well. Because ideally, they would answer most of the questions. Because it's a very short period of time and you want to answer all the questions. Because if you don't answer all, I mean, think about it. If you were paid to come in and sit at an advisory committee and you had five questions that were really bothering you after reading the briefing book and only two of them got answered, that would leave a lot of ambiguity for you, right? And you may vote no, because physicians do no harm. You know, we, the last thing we want to do is approve something that shouldn't be approved. That's been done a lot. It normally doesn't turn out well and people who did the approval get criticized. So we don't want to be doing that. So it's really important that we try to answer all those questions. So a mo an adroit moderator who can just bang through the answers quickly is very important. Then we have the triage, the people who are calling up the slides. We talked about the backroom staff. The stakeholder engagement, those are the people who actually will get people to come to the open public hearing. And that might sound a little sticky, like, Gee, we really ask people to come. It's an open public hearing. We, we try to get people to show up for the open public hearing. Absolutely. It's, it, we, you, you do it. You do it. You're completely open about it. You encourage patients, clinicians, advocacy groups. You let them know about the meeting. You don't tell them what to say, but you tell them what the issues are and why you want them to attend. You, it's advocacy. You want them to advocate. So absolutely take an active role in that. And then when you think about it, you're going you're to see here that we're going to do lots of mocks and rehearsals and presenta internal presentations. So there's lots of logistics involved. So you need a logistics support person. So it takes an, a pretty large team in order to prepare. So my two people who prep for advisory committees. So far, this makes sense? Yeah? OK. Now, we also want to research and analyze the advisory committee members. Why? Why do you think we want to do that? Somebody. We want to find out what's important to them, right? Absolutely. Because this is not an advisory board. So if, if you've been in industry, industry runs advisory boards all the time. They'll bring in subject matter experts, and they'll show them the data and say, what do you think? Should we be concerned about this? Is this safety issue? Is, are these adverse events? Worrisome, or can they be managed? We ask their opinion. We don't want to ask the opinions of the advisory committee members. Our goal that day is to get them to vote yes. So we want influence. And in order to influence people, we need to know what influences the audience, right? If we want to influence the audience, we want to know what, what their influencers are. So what we want to do is profile each and every advisory committee member. So let's look at one of the committees. So this is the Peripheral and Central Nervous System Drug Advisory Committee as it stands today. What do you notice about this committee? They're all doctors, a lot of clinical doctors. Look at their expertise. You have a pharmacoepidemiologist. You have a bunch of neurologists, which you would expect, right? But you also have a biostatistician and a, and a psychiatrist. So you've got four different disciplines. And this is a pretty good one where there's some consistency. Look at their areas of interest. Do you think a neurologist who specializes in migraine is going to have the same kind of interest as one who specializes, who specializes in Alzheimer's? Completely different career, right? They have very, they, very little in common. So you have to know what makes them tick, especially as it relates to your product. So how do you do that? Oh, one other thing is you've got a, a whole different group of experience. You've got one doctor who's been to 18 meetings 
And then you have one who hasn't been to a meeting yet. The ALS expert hasn't even been to a meeting yet. So you had some people who are just newbies and some who are groupies. So that, that changes the dynamic too, right? So what we recommend you do is you profile each one of them. You look at what their medical interests are. What are their board certifications? Where do they work? You look at what kind of committees they're involved with. Are they, are they interested? Are they part of a journal? Are they part of a review committee? How active are they in certain areas? Are they part of any, of any advocacy groups? Again, what makes them tick? For, especially if you've been at 18 meetings, do they normally vote yes or no? If they vote yes, why? If they vote no, why? Do we have any of the issues that have pushed them to vote no? How did those sponsors handle those issues? And did they do it well? Could they have done it better? It's all in the transcripts. So the FDA publishes the transcripts. So there's, you can go online right now and look at the transcript from every single meeting, the slides going back. There's probably really good data going back to about 2006. After, prior to 2006, it gets a little spotty. So all that information can be mined and it's out there. And then what we do is we make sure that we look through those transcripts, we look at your data, and you should be doing this, looking at your data to find out what's relevant. Is there anything relevant to those advisory committee members as it relates to your data? This way you can anticipate the questions. Then it gets to the data. All right, so first you need to know the audience, your audience. Yes, go ahead. So there's a whole application process. Great question. Uh, yes, uh, how does the FDA decide who sits on the actual advisory committee? So there's, there's a process to become a special governmental employee. And you apply, and I, I, anecdotally I heard it takes about three years from beginning to end, the whole vetting process. Uh, so that right now, uh, we have our own, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to make this a commercial, I'm just trying to give you some data. We have our own database of every person who's ever sat on an advisory committee, and there's about 4,000 special governmental employees, uh, as far as we can tell. We started research of this back in 2003. Uh, and that's important because that's, that's the pool they normally pick from. They add a few every year. They're constantly looking for more people. Uh, so they go through a process. They ask people for applications. If you go on the FDA website, one of the most prominent uh, banners is apply to become an advisory committee member. Uh, there is a real tight conflict of interest. Uh, so if you've taken money from industry directly as a researcher, as a clinical trialist, or you personally have gotten money, you're normally disqualified. Uh, it's a pretty low threshold. I think it's is it around five grand, Bert. Five or ten yeah, five or ten thousand dollars. Yeah. So they, they can waive that, but it's rarely done. Uh, there uh, since Padufa four, they've been monitoring those metrics about the the number of waivers because there's this perceived conflict of interest. Uh, and in our view, um, the the quality of, of advisory committee members have has actually decreased in many cases. Um, since Padufa IV, because of the conflict of interest, you have people who aren't involved in clinical trials looking at clinical trial data. So it, gets, it becomes very difficult. There are some really great advisory committee members, but a lot of them are truly um, not well versed in clinical trials and in studying you know, data. So there's a piece of education that comes with that. Okay. Uh, yes? Right, yeah, so these, so this is public information right here. So uh, you can look up all 50 advisory committee members, really transparent on the FDA website, and it'll give you a lot of inf information about them. So, and you, so if you're going to appear in one of these meetings, you'll know exactly who's going to be on the committee that you're going to appear? Not before. exactly. So you'll have to assume if you're, if you're going to the peripheral and central nervous system drug advisory committee, you're going to have to, these people will be invited. Some of them might be able to make it, some of them won't be able to make it. But because they have a term, these people have a term, and the term will be right on the FDA website. So you'll know if their term expires before you go to advisory committee or if they're going to be replaced. The FDA can also invite temporary voting members, and frequently do. So if, if your drug is for ALS, and let's say that you're the one doc here uh, doctor, of course I picked the doctor's name, I can, can't say. If Merritt can't make that meeting, 
they're probably going to bring another ALS, ALS expert in. You hope they do. You want experts in your therapeutic area to actually be at the meeting because uh, they normally ask the best questions. So that you don't find out. You don't find out the exact roster until two business days prior to the meeting. So if your meeting's on Tuesday, you find out on Friday. If your meeting's on Wednesday, you find out on Monday. So that's, that's sort of a hassle. And FDA will not tell you in advance. And one of the reasons is sponsors have reached out to advisory committee members to try to influence them, which is terrible. Never recommend doing that. Yes? Just to clarify, so there's a you just go by the list that's on the FDA website and you just kind of guess who will be invited based on their therapeutic area and then go from there? Or will FDA actually send a list of here's who we're inviting but we don't know who's confirmed yet? Nope. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. All of these members, every committee has, a, has a, an elected, if you will, a, a, this is the committee roster. So this is public information. All these people will be invited because they're on the roster. They've signed up. They've been assigned to this committee for two to four years. And they will be invited to every meeting. But maybe they can't make it that day. They're on vacation. And they're not going to cancel their vacation because they're right in the middle of their vacation and they're in Prague. So they're not going to fly back for that meeting. So they just may not make it. And you won't know that. FDA will not tell you. I, at least in my experience, FDA has never told a sponsor. Sorry about that. FDA has never told the sponsor who's going to be at the meeting in advance. They tell everybody, the public, it's posted on the FDA website, along with the briefing books, two business days in advance of the meeting. So the world finds out at the same time. They will, in almost every case, but I don't think they've ever only invited these committee members. They always have temporary voting members, right? Uh, sometimes they do for pediatric uh, oncology. Stuff. So pediatric, sometimes it's just pediatric? Okay, so there's a pediatric oncology advisory committee and that's all pediatricians and oncologists so they don't always bring in temporary voting members for that. But normally FDA is really good about bringing in true subject matter experts so they have at least one or two at your meeting. So thank you, that's a, thank you for clarifying that. I want to make sure uh, everybody's got it. issue experts. So if you have a right. liver toxicity for instance, they bring in liver uh, experts to clarify it for the, uh, for the FDA. Right, and so a lot of it depends on the profile of your data. You know, if, if you have a clear QT signal, they're gonna bring in electrophysiologists and cardiologists with expertise in QT prolongation. If you don't have that signal, they're not gonna bring them in. You know, so it'll be, a lot of it will be driven by the data. Make sense? The FDA really does try to have a great meeting, so, I mean, they do their best to get the experts there. We've actually been called by FDA division directors saying, stop inviting all the experts to your mocks. You're conflicting them, and we need some at our meeting. Sorry. So, <laughs> so we, we know they're looking. All right. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. So again, from industry, who here um, has looked at clinical trial data, and you've gone into a meeting, and the people in the room aren't being honest about the data. They're, just, they're, they're ignoring signals, or they just don't want to admit right, that, oh, it's not that bad. What's the big deal? We elevated blood pressure by 20. It's not a big deal. You know? Or, OK, we had seven deaths, and they were all in the active group. It's a play of chance. You know, has, has that happened? I mean, probably not that exaggerated, right? Because we all, we all love our baby, right? And, I, and I, you know, our babies are, are beautiful. And, and we've spent 10 years, and we've done three phase three trials, and now we finally have the data, and we want it to be great. And we want it to be great because we've invested so much time, and we're hopeful for the patients. It comes from a good place. But that doesn't make it right. right? We have to be honest with our data. Uh, and the advisory committee members are going to be brutally honest with your data. So what you need to do to prepare for this meeting, and really to prepare for any valid scientific meeting, is to do have a comprehensive analysis of your data. So remember that I mentioned there were triage people for the call up the slides. We normally recommend at least three triage people. So we recommend that you go through your data in buckets. So here's an example of, of a, just a typical drug and all of the different things you have to look at in three different buckets. 
There's sort of the other category in unmet need, and there's efficacy and safety. And you just go through and systematically go, through, and you may have different buckets for, your, for whatever your clinical development program is, but you go through and you just systematically analyze it. it. Do we have data, and have we looked at the data on all of these different areas that'll be important to an advisory committee? So that's one of the reasons you go back and look at prior advisory committees. What's been important to FDA and prior advisory committee members to help us with the buckets? And then you, you, you're going to prioritize some of these over others, depending on the data. And then you summarize the data into a nice report where you actually call out and highlight what's bad, what's ambiguous, what's concerning. You get really serious about being really critical with your data before the advisory committee members get really critical with your data. You want to get out in front of it. And you do a gap analysis. You go through and you, and you go through and you find out all of the questions that could occur at an advisory committee meeting. So it's a really deep dive and you, you, you need to be incredibly self-respect, respect, reflective and honest with the shortcomings of your own data. I mean, we've had clients where, you know, the treatment paradigm has changed in the middle of their clinical development program. It's not their fault, but now the standards are completely different and it doesn't align with how they ran their trial. Well, that's gonna be an issue. It's not your fault, but it's gonna be an issue at the advisory committee, so let's get out in front of it and let's address it. I've had clients say, well, it's not our fault. They shouldn't even talk about that. They agree, FDA agreed to this protocol. <laughs> you know, sorry, that's terrible for you, but it's going to be an issue. Stuff happens, especially when there's a prolonged clinical development programs. And then you have to go beyond your data. Look at, look at your FDA correspondence. I had a client, and there was a preclinical tox issue. They had multiple, Bert and I worked on this project together, multiple tumor types in rats and mice, male and female. They had male rats and mice getting breast cancer. And in FDA correspondence, they said, that, you know, we're, we'll let you proceed with your clinical development program, but this will be a review issue. Well, the sponsor said, well, it's no big deal. They said it was going to be a review issue. It's a huge deal. They said it's going to be a review issue. So you have to really, again, be critical with the, the FDA is telling you when there are issues, it, you know, embrace it. They're trying to help you. If you haven't taken the FDA advice on what your endpoint should be, or if you haven't taken a dose from phase two in the, days th in the phase three, which happens, that they say, we want you to take both doses in the phase three, and management's decided not to do that. It's going to be a review issue. It's fine that you made the decision, but now it's advisory committee time. They will bring it up. They will bring up every single thing that you didn't agree to for that advisory committee meeting. You have to assume that. The FDA also does not like setting precedent, and that translates into the opinions of the advisory committee members, because they don't want to set precedent either, because the FDA has already told them we don't want to set precedent. So if you're doing something different, like if a certain division hasn't let you use oral data for one indication for oral data in another indication, I don't know, just a crazy thought. If a certain division hasn't, hasn't allowed other sponsors to do that, that's going, and, and you go ahead and do that, that's gonna be an issue at the advisory committee, even, even if they've allowed you to do it for the first time. FDA doesn't like setting precedent. So if you're doing something precedent setting, which could be very positive, just expect that it's going to become an issue at the advisory committee. Any questions before I move on to preparing deliverables? Okay. We have three main deliverables for an advisory committee. It's the briefing book, the core presentation, and the Q&A. So let's go through a little bit about how to present on those three. You're gonna have a lot of very complicated scientific data. Does anybody remember how long you have to present? What's that? About an hour, right? So um, we just worked with a client who had seven or eight phase three programs. And for RA patients, two doses, seven or eight, they had, you know, some treatment naive, some you know, different stages, it was very complicated. Seven different phase three programs, two different drugs. Ha they had an hour to present. Really hard to do that. This presentation is longer than an hour. 
and we're really not going into that much detail, right? So we need to explain it simply. Einstein said, if you, don't, if you can't explain it simply, you just don't understand it well enough. So I don't like to edit Einstein, but I'm going to. What, what he would have said, I think, if we were advisory committee members, if he was preparing you for an advisory committee member a meeting, is you need to explain it so simply that an advisor can understand it well enough. That's even a higher bar. You might understand it, but you don't have time to go through all of the data with them. So you have to explain it so simply that somebody who spent four to seven hours, we hope, preparing for the meeting, and we hope pays attention for the one hour, will actually understand it. It's a really high bar. So the messages have to just jump off the page. You've got to be really focused on why they should be voting yes. So the first thing I tell my clients is, we have to separate what is scientifically interesting from what is scientifically important for approval. And we leave the stuff that doesn't, that Venn diagram, that doesn't cross over to scientifically important for approval, we leave that for another day. You don't have time. Give me the reasons I should vote yes. Now some of those reasons might be how you're addressing a safety concern. Don't sugarcoat it, you have to be honest about it. If you have a real safety concern, then you need to address how you're, how you're going to deal with that in the real world to protect, patients, to protect the patients. But, so that's a key issue. That's, that would be a key message. But it needs to be just that. What's important for approval? So how do you do that? You need to create your messages in a way that is opposite to a lot of the way people in this room might think. Who here has a scientific background? I'm going to lower my hand, okay, because I don't. Scientific background, a bunch of scientists. Amazing, you don't have a scientific background. Okay, you and I will talk later. So, so when, you open up, when, when you open up a trade journal or an article, what's the first thing you read? The title, then what? Then the, the, uh, the abstract. The abstract. So what are you going for? The, the summary. I love, we've never met before, right, sir? Never met before. You want to go for the headline, the summary. The top, the, what, we all want the conclusion. You're a scientist, right? You raised your hand. Even scientists want the conclusions first. When you go to a scientific lecture, what happens? What do they start with? Data. It's all about data. Data, data, data. We, we do data for 45 minutes, and then we get to the conclusion. As the scientists are presenting all the data, as an audience member, what are you doing? What's that? You're, 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 all right, you're asleep. You're, you're, you're glazed over. All right, my eyes glaze over. Some of you are forming your own conclusions, right? And they may not be the same conclusion that I have. If I tell you the conclusion first and then backfill it with all the facts to prove it, I have to be able to prove it. You can't have a conclusion that, say, that says you don't have QTC prolongation, but your, your thorough QT study says you do. So you know, the, the conclusion has to match the facts. But you start with the conclusion first, because that's what scientists want to. We just proved it here today. And then whenever possible, we give the clinical relevance. What's the example? What's the story? Why is it important for patients? Right? Because we want to we wanna help. This, this help people see what's relevant. Because often, the, you know, I hear all the time, well, the data speaks for themselves. Really? Have you ever heard data speak? Data do not speak for themselves. So you need to give the data, the conclusion, the data, and then the clinical relevance. Why is it important for patients? Why is it important for clinicians? And then we bottom line it. We rephrase it. We summarize it. The marketing people say, tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them, and then tell them what you told them. And that's what this is. You tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them with the facts, and then you tell them what you told them with rephrasing the headline. And that's how you control, in a, in a one-hour presentation, that's how you control your message. And you, you, need, you need to give them the reason to believe, the reason to vote yes. It's really hard to do. So it's, it's going to be completely different than a lot of the scientific meetings that you've been to. But it will be more interesting. Now we get to the briefing book, the second deliverable. The briefing book has to align with the core presentation. Have you ever read a book and then gone to a movie and the movie's different than the book? And you love the book, right? The book is great. Because if Lee's written your briefing book, it's great. 
It's a great briefing book. And then you go to the meeting and go, well, that's, that's not what I read on the plane here in the four hours that I had. It's different. And then I start thinking while you're presenting, I wonder why it's different. That's an analysis I didn't see. I'm going to ask a question about that. Now we're, create, we're confusing our audience. And then at the end of it, when they don't get it, you go, well, they didn't get it. It's their fault. It's, you know, they didn't understand my point. Well, maybe they didn't understand the point because you confused the heck out of them. And you probably shouldn't do that. So if they have spent the time to read the briefing book, let's make sure it aligns with what we're actually going to tell them. Right? The pre-read matches the presentation. They want it to be short. $80 an hour. They're not making a lot of money to do this. They're spending about four to five hours, four to seven hours prepping. So they want it to be really short. How short? We surveyed 100 former FDA advisory committee members. They want it less, 92%, so they want it to be less than 100 pages. That's pretty short. You think it's easy to summarize seven clinical trials, even two clinical trials, unless we have to go through, you know, the, the PK data, the trial designs, the need, the efficacy, the safety, your, your post-approval study plan, less than 100 pages, really hard to do. I mean, your NDA is going to be thousands, maybe tens of thousands of pages. So this isn't just a mini NDA. This is a completely different kind of writing. So it needs to be really short, really easily read. They're looking for the abstract. Let's give them what they're looking for. So one of the things we do is we'll do a 15-page executive summary. Is that about right, Lee? About 15 pages? Because we know that they, they normally read the sponsor executive summary, and if it agrees with the FDAs, then they're okay. They just read the FDA briefing book. So the executive summary's got to be really good. So sometimes we go a little bit longer in hopes that they'll at least read that. And then what the 85 pages that follows is support for the executive summary. So all of the reasons to vote yes need to be in your executive summary. OK? Questions? No medical writers in the room? No questions. OK. Question. Oh, we have a question? We have one medical writer in the room? OK. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. I'm not a medical writer. <laughs> um, so earlier you mentioned that the FDA or that the briefing books are due 30 days before the meeting. 20, for drugs, it's 22 business days, which is okay. about 30 days. Um, but then everything gets posted online, open to the public, two business days beforehand. Yeah. So does the sponsor get a copy of the FDA briefing book before that two-day? Yes, or is great question. You're asking great questions. Thank you. Yes, mm -hmm. they do, and I left that out. Uh, Bert, what is it? Uh, it varies a little bit. Drugs and devices are a little bit different. But for drugs? Calendar days are 14 business days. 20 calendar days, 14 20 business days. And is that by regulation? Is that, is that yep. due for four or five? Yeah. Okay. It's a little bit looser for the device side, although they're tracking more and more with drugs. Um, I've, I've done most of the device work at 3D, so I've, I, I find, and I've done a bunch of drug work too, but I find that on the device side, there's more of a collaborative effort between the agency and the sponsor in, in sharing data. I've actually seen the, the FDA, when they do their executive summary, pull graphs and tables up from the sponsor briefing book into their executive summary. So it's just, it's, it's less of a separation. Uh, on the drug side, it's normally a completely independent right of the FDA briefing book and the sponsor's briefing book, which is why it's really important to get aligned. So for example, a, a, a common struggle is, all right, we're going to present safety data. What safety population do we use? Do we only use our phase three pivotal because we have placebo to compare against because it was a placebo control trial? Do we do our open label extension? Do we do our phase two because we had patients in our phase two, so that adds to the, that adds to the data? We have different exposures. Do we, do, we, do we adjust based on exposure rate? How do we do it? You might have seven different safety data sets in, a, in an NDA. You could have more. So, and there could be very good reasons for picking different safety populations for different analyses. If you're looking for rare events, you want as much exposure as possible, so you're going to you might pool additional data. If you're looking for common events and you want to see if there's a difference between placebo, you might just decide, you know, the best data is going to be, without even looking at the data, the best way to look at this is against placebo so we can see if, if there's a treatment difference. Well, the FDA might have a different view. They might just have a different logical stream of thought. You don't want the advisors getting completely different data sets 
for the safety analysis. So what do you do? You talk to the FDA. You say, what data set do you, are you going to, this is what we think. Do you think this, this is why we think this makes sense. Do you agree? Because we want to be aligned. We don't want to confuse. If, if you have a different view, we're open to it. Maybe we'll just take your view. Often the numbers don't change at all. The issues don't change at all. You know, but I've seen clients get hung up with, well, if we use this data set, it's a 17.2% adverse event rate and placebo 16. If we use this data set, it's 16.9. It's and it just looks better to get that 16 versus 16 versus 17. I said, really? And it's a, you're going to use a different data set in the FDA to take off three-tenths of a percent on one of your set. That, that's, no, don't do that. So be honest with the data, align with the FDA, make it easy for the advisors that day. Don't make them think. We really don't want them thinking a lot. We want them agreeing with us. We want them to vote yes. That's the goal for the day. Trust me, when you get back to the office, if you've had a unanimous yes vote, you're, you're brilliant. And if you've done you know, the scientifically pure presentation that doesn't you know, no, we argued with the FDA, they picked the wrong data set, so we had a different safety data set, and you get a six to six vote, you're not so brilliant. You know, so you want to, you want to minimize the confusion at the advisory committee so they get it. It's your responsibility to make sure they get it. So normally there's an introduction, the sponsor does that. There's an unmet need presentation, that's normally an outside expert who comes in and they talk about therapeutic area, how they treat patients. Uh, the trial designs and the efficacy results. There could be preclinical data here. You could go over phase two and phase three. It really depends on the data set. Is your phase two data important? Was dose ranging really important? Or is there a clear dose response? So it's just really not that important. Put it in the briefing book. We don't need it in the core presentation. So there is some, there's a lot of flexibility here based on the data. You want to make sure you're telling the right science, the pertinent scientific story for that day. You're not trying to hide anything. Just trying to make it relevant. Remember, the reasons for approval, not what's scientifically interesting. Um, again, we talked a lot about safety, but <clears throat> what's the right safety set to look at? Uh, usually the efficacy is separate. If you have two trials, and normally on drugs you have two trials, sometimes you have three. Sometimes devices, you can do one depending on the application pathway. Uh, you separate the efficacy data. You keep it by, by trial because you want to show that you were able to repeat in a second trial. You don't pull it. Sponsors often like the pool, especially if they have a 0.052 p-value in one and a 0.01 in the other. When they pull it, they get 0.02. It's a beautiful thing. They want to pull it. No. If you missed your, your, your statistical you know, threshold on your second trial, be honest about it. FDA will be. I can guarantee it. But for safety, you often integrate the, this, the safety set because, again, you're looking for exposure. You're looking for numbers. You're looking to reduce those confidence intervals. Make sense? Uh, normally, you talk about post-approval study plan, if that's important, and then you have a conclusion, a clinical perspective. That could be inside or outside people doing that presentation. Similar for devices, I will say on the device side, they use more external experts as their presenters. I've seen, in, uh, I've seen PIs for trials actually do efficacy and safety, rarely done on the drug side. On the drug side, it's normally sponsor-driven. I think part of that is because the devices are, it's more about delivery technique, it's more tactical, so you want the actual doctor who's actually delivered the device. Um, now let's talk about questions. Don't be afraid of the questions. The questions never do damage. The answers, however, can do a lot of damage. So what we want to make sure is that we identify the most likely questions and that you identify the questions you hope don't get asked, answered or asked. The ones that you hope don't get asked are probably the ones where you have the least amount of data and are probably the most important ones. So make sure you prioritize those. Then you want to write out the answers. You want to know who's going to respond on your team. And then you have to practice, practice, practice. Um, let's talk a little bit about developing and managing slides. How many slides do you think you're going to have going into an advisory committee meeting for backup to answer all the questions? Hundreds? How about a couple thousand? You have a couple thousand backup slides. I can guarantee it. Okay, we we, we had one client who had nine thousand. Now that client was they were, they were into slide Olympics, but 
9,000 is not necessary. But our, our norm is about anywhere between 1,500 and 2,500 backup slides. So it's really important that they're organized and managed efficiently. Uh, so when you present, when you, and one of the reasons there's a lot is because they can't be the slides that you're used to seeing where you cram everything onto a slide and you need a laser pointer to, to point out what the important data are. We need to spoon feed it. So we need to come up with all the different questions and then have slides that are, that are pertinent just to those questions. So one main idea per slide, really simple. If you need a laser pointer, your slide's not finished. All right, if you need to, if you need to turn around and point at the screen as to what the important information is, it's too complicated. You're going you're gonna to answer about 50 questions that day, and you don't have that much time to answer them. So there, there's not more than an hour of Q&A, even throughout the whole day. So your answers have to be really succinct to the point. You've got to keep moving. So your slides need to be really simple to the point, and you have to keep moving. So one of the things we recommend you do is in the bottom half of the slide, you write out the question. Who's going to answer it? Who's the responder? No original thinking that day. What's the short answer? Do you need more detailed information to answer the question? What's the bridge? Let me blow that up for you. What's the bridge to our key message? Remember we talked about those message pyramids, those key messages? During Q&A, all the questions are going to be really aggressive, really negative. The, the advisors are going to be pressing you on the shortcomings of your data. They're not going to say, wow, you had a 0.01 p-value in your first trial. Tell me more about that. How did you achieve such success? No, they're going to be looking at the shortcomings of your trial. They're going to be looking at your safety data and any imbalances. All the questions are going to have a negative tone. They're going to be probing. So after you answer the question, you can't stop. If we just said negative question, answer, negative question, answer, negative question, answer, by the end of the meeting, you'd be depressed. You need to bridge to a key message every now and then. But, here, but let me put this in perspective. The most important thing to remember is, and you get back to that, that key message, so you bring them back after you answer their question. You can't be a politician. You, actually, you can't bridge right to key message. You actually answer the question first and then bridge the key message. So I'm sure all of you have SharePoint sites at work or some kind of way to share data. If you don't, you should. Um, set it up with all of your slides so you can share the slides and go through and QC and make sure that there's a good, that you're not overriding each other's slides. You're not deleting slides that you're going to need later. It needs to be a very organized approach if you're going to have a couple thousand slides and a, more than one cook in the kitchen. You might have, you know, the three triage people and six of the presenters might all be collaborating on these slides. There needs to be a way to share them. I I'm going to fly through stakeholder engagement because we talked about that a little bit earlier. But the bottom line is you want to get them to the meeting. It brings that independent third party voice, it brings that patient voice to the meeting for that one hour open public hearing. It's, it's often, there'll often be things that you know about the therapeutic area that you know to be true that your clinicians are telling you, but it wasn't studied in the trial. So you can't really talk about it that day. You as sponsor, you're supposed to present the data from the trial. So the open public hearing can be a good place to bring in that patient voice or the clinician voice about the therapeutic area where they can go outside, well outside your trial, and talk about their experience. So that's sometimes it's important to bring that perspective of clinical relevance that was outside of your actual clinical development program. Because again, things change while you're studying your product. The open public hearing can influence votes. 28% of the people we polled said sometimes or frequently it influences my vote. If I've got 10 members on the committee, that's two or three potential people I influence. I'd much rather have a 10-0 vote than an 8-2 to two, or an 8-2 to two vote versus a 5-5 five to five vote. I want to influence those three people and move them my way. So bring them to the meeting. Uh, we also have to rehearse. You don't go to the meeting that first, that for the first time and just present that day. So you run mocks. How do you run mocks? How do you find people to run mocks? Do you bring in people from your office? You know, the, the actual doctors that were involved in the clinical trials and 
and clinical people from the company, and you sit around, and you present to them, and you present the data, right? They know the most about the data, right? That makes sense, doesn't it? No, bad idea. You want, what you want to do is pick people who are just like the advisory committee members. So do you remember uh, Dr. Green? He's our neurologist who's got an expertise in migraines, and he's been at 14 meetings. You need to go into the FDA's group of people who have been at advisory committee and people, advisory committees before and find the neurologists. In the FDA database, if you look at all of their different meetings, there's 231 neurologists. If we take out the ones that are already on the committee or are, are already have experience with this committee, that gets it down to 91. The other 140 some have, 140 have been on other committees. We'd like the, the ones that have been on this committee. And then if you take out the ones that are either NIH or on the committee right now, you get down to 75. And I remember this doctor had an interest in migraines. If you look at the ones that were on this committee, were neurologists who aren't conflicted and have migraine experience, you have three. Here are the three docs. These are the right people to bring in to match up against Dr. Green, not some neurologist who's got an expertise in ALS. That'll match up against a different doctor. So you need to go through and find these people so the mock meetings are very similar to the actual meeting you're going to have because these docs are going to ask questions a completely different way than another neurologist with another area, another area of expertise will, have, will ask questions. You need to practice like you play. Make sense? And from a timeline standpoint, I think in the book we have a six-month timeline for the two of you who have read Chapter 5. Is slightly insulted. Okay, so uh, we actually we actually like more. So a, a six-month timeline really compresses it. Ideally, you'd get a nine-month timeline. You could fit in three mocks. You're going to do a core presentation and a new briefing book for every mock. You're going to send that mock pan the the mock panel members the actual briefing book so they could prep just like an actual advisory committee member would prep. We recommend you do unique panel members every time. You don't bring back the same. Because if I come to a meeting a second time and hear the data a second time, I'm hearing it differently. Now I have, I have my knowledge from the first meeting. You've answered questions from the first meeting. So my questions are going to be completely different. The panel members that day, your advisory committee members, only hear the, your data once. So you want your mock panel members to be completely naive to prior presentations. That's why you don't bring friends and family in. You don't have your clinical trial members in. You don't have colleagues from your office in. They know, the they know it too well. And you'll get great questions. None of them will be the questions that are asked the day of the meeting. And that's the goal of these mocks, is to give people rehearsal time, but also anticipate the questions that are going to be asked so we can make sure we have great answers for them. OK? Another question. How do you usually get these mock folks to come in? I mean, you pay them a lot of money. You pay them, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they get, I mean, they're, <laughs> let's face it, that's what it is. Um, it's anywhere between, you're going to pay them anywhere between $3,000 and $6,000 for the day, including prep time. It's a great gig for them. How do you find these people? So, the hard way to do it is you go through all of the rosters of the prior FDA advisory committee meetings. The easy way to do it is to bring in somebody like us who has a database, and I can do that, that sort function where I go in and search. That's, that, that's actual data. You just go in, we have keyword search, and you do it. But you can do it manually. You can go through the last 30 meetings from this committee, get all the rosters, put them in an Excel spreadsheet, and find them. But it's a pain, it is a pain in the neck, but it's, it's really important to having good mocks. Yes, sir. So when you have these F FDA meetings and, you, and the sponsor is responding to a question from the advisory committee, would FDA follow up saying this is the sponsor's understanding, this is where we disagree or something like that? Often, yes, okay. often. You know, the FDA, so in that U that I showed you, that, that all the seats were highlighted in blue and I said these are the advisory committee members, so I should recolor two or three of those seats. Two or three people from, from the division will sit at the U. And if the sponsor says something that the FDA does not agree with, they will jump in and say, well, that's not entirely true. That's not our perspective. 
or we ask the sponsor. So if they say, well, we only took the 400 milligram dose in the phase three, we didn't take the 200 milligram dose in the phase three because there really wasn't any efficacy in phase two trials. And if, if FDA told you to bring both doses into phase three, they will jump in and say, well, that's not the way we see it. We, we wanted the sponsor to bring both doses into phase three because we did see efficacy at the 200 milligram dose and we wanted to make sure that we were using the minimally clinically effective dose, the lowest effective dose, and they just decided not to do it. So the FDA will do that. So, so that's why there's no, that's why you have to be honest with you because you don't want, because then you just look like a liar, right? Then I, and now I start questioning everything you've told me, right? So these are all the strategies for sponsors to get their drug approved. So would FDA be having similar strategies before coming to the meeting saying, well, you know, this is our view. I mean, not, I'm not saying they'll block the drug or anything, no, no. but they would say. F no, absolutely. FDA prepares. There's no question. Right. FDA prepares. FDA wants to, I probably made it sound a little adversarial. It's, if F often FDA advocates for approval. You know, it's, sometimes you go in and it's a love fest because they love the data. And they, you know, they, but there are a couple questions and they want an independent panel to, to answer the questions. Sometimes it's just because it's a new chemical entity and since PDUFA 4, all NCEs go to advisory committee unless there is a clear reason why they shouldn't. And FDA just, just prefers to take NCEs to advisory committee. Or it's a first in class device, they might love the data, but they want to show industry, here's how, if you work with us, here's how good it can be. So it's not always adversarial. Uh, but you know, FDA wants good products, good drugs, and good devices to get approved. But they will, if they don't agree, they will go toe-to-toe -to -toe also. Because yeah, they're, and, I mean, FDA truly wants to protect public health. And, and sponsors and don't always want to do that. Yeah, and, and I'll let you know in the, in the briefing book. So their briefing book is a very good um, source of how they're going to feel about your product. And usually the presentation that they give is, is very similar to what they, they say in a briefing book. Uh, does that mean Dr. Mark Green sit this side this time as a current member and next time he can sit the other side as a mock he can. member? Yep. And if Dr. Green votes no a lot, he would be a really good mock member because he'll, A, he'll come in with a lot, of, a lot of critique and B, you don't want FDA bringing him back as a temporary voting member to sit on your panel if he votes no a lot. If he votes yes a lot and doesn't, doesn't contribute much um, to the conversation, then he's probably not a good mock panel member because he's too friendly. And you want almost harsh critique during your mocks, right? You want the critical thinkers. So you get, sort of get a two for one. You, get the real, you want the really tough people to come to your mocks and you conflict them from come, going back and being a temporary voting member for at least that meeting. But yes, absolutely, they switch. Yep. So but as, as long as they have their term, you cannot invite them for, or they will always say no, you cannot invite them for a mock. So only afterwards, when they're, when they're uh, yeah, or out. That's right. Yes? So one of the things you mentioned was discussing unmet needs. So there's so many Me Too drugs, like think of statins. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you know, presenting another statin, how do you show that your statin fulfills an unmet need since there may already be five statin drugs on the market? Well, if you have a lower case of rhabdo, that would be really, a lower incidence of rhabdo, that'd be really good. If you've done a head-to-head -head against another statin and you show either an efficacy or safety benefit of any kind, that would be good. Uh, but you're right, the, the more products that are on the market, the higher the bar gets, as it should, frankly. Um, and the, you know, the greater the expectation is that there'll be incremental value. You see it a lot in oncology, whereas uh, they're looking for a minimum improvement in overall survival. And was it four, is four months sort of the threshold for most products? Well, it depends a little bit what the, the, the baseline is. If it's six months, it's, it's two to three months extra. If it's 12 months, it's four months. If it's 24 months, then you have to go really six or, or even nine months extra. So if, if, yeah. if, if there's seven different therapies and, yep. and, and the expectation is you go six months and you did five and a half, that's going to be an issue. Yeah, and it's probably seven to is price ever discussed in these things? Because you mentioned oncology, and there's so many, you know, especially with the, the new antibody therapies yep. and, and 
and CAR T cells and the you know those things are very expensive. So is price ever discussed in these? Uh... So I used to say no, absolutely not. <laughs> FDA will stop it from being discussed. I'm getting less resolute in my conviction on that. FDA sent a clear signal to industry that they're looking for industry to be part of the solution on the high cost of drugs and devices. And they haven't yet put pricing as a discussion topic, but they don't always shut down the conversation as quickly as they used to. It's still, I'm still pretty comfortable telling our clients it's highly unlikely, but then I say, but let's prep for it just in case it happens. So I recently had, not a price issue, but I had an, advise, an FDA advisory committee member ask a question of a sponsor. They said, we want to see, there was only three study sites, it was a device, we want to see the results by site and we want to sort the results high to low on how much the study site got paid. We want to see if the payment to the study site influenced the results. Fortunately, the sponsor was able to do that during the break, and it was opposite. The lowest paid site had the best data, so it was like, Phew. But if it turned out the other way, even though the sponsor was like, hey, come on, it's, you know, they get paid based on the amount of patients they see. It's not, there's no, there was no incongruity. But the FDA allowed that question to be asked. So that's, that, norm, that really surprised me that they allowed that question to be asked. That's not a direct pricing issue, but they are getting a little bit more lenient, some, some of the divisions. So you have to be ready for it. Okay? I think I left Bert a little bit of time. Yeah, a little bit. That's okay. Okay. <laughs>